Welcome to Time Monk Radio Network. I'm Gemini, and we are welcoming back Susan Weed as part of our health and wellness series. We are shifting our focus away from prostate and onto breasts. Susan is joining us to discuss breast cancer risks and how to reduce them. Hello, Susan. Welcome back to Time Monk Radio. Oh, I'm so glad to be with you again, Gemini. Hard to believe that another uh, week has passed, and here we are ready to broach a new topic. Yes, I am um, looking forward to moving away from the very informative prostate uh, segments and moving on to breast health. It's kind of similar, you know? Mm-hmm. My book, Breast Cancer, question mark, breast health, exclamation point, the wise woman way. When I sell this book to a man, I take a black marker and I mark out breast and I write prostate. Oh, good point. Because breast cancer and prostate cancer are very, very similar, and breast health and prostate health are very similar as well. So if you really, you know, studied up and listened to everything, you know, in the last four segments, you could probably skip these unless you're really interested. And personally, I do think it's like really interesting. The more I delved into what was going on with breast cancer and what I needed to do to protect myself, the murkier the waters became. I'm sure you've heard this from many other people as well, that, you know, science would have us believe that uh, basically there isn't really anything you can do to prevent breast cancer. The best you can hope for is early detection. And that the best way to have early detection is with a yearly mammogram. So this was actually one of the places where I started because I wanted to know For myself, would it be a wise decision or an unwise decision to go and have a mammogram? Well, the first thing that I thought of, and I bet it's the first thing that you think of too, is, well, gosh, that's an x-ray. That's radiation, right? Absolutely. And, I mean, I'm a little radiation shy even at the dentist office. Like, I'm, not, you know, I'm, they, they look at me and they go, oh, right, she's the one who doesn't like us to take x-rays all the time, so put it off. You know, and I've got them, you know, like way down to thinking about 25% of the x-rays that they want to take. And, they're, you know, nobody's suffering for it. So uh, this was really a big issue to me. And I kept asking about it. And uh, the answers that, that I got, um, well, we're going to talk about them in the second segment. What is a mammogram, really, and how does it affect your breasts, really, and is it preventative medicine? And, of course, one of the really scary things to me is that a certain percentage of mammograms show up um, with findings that could be cancer, but we can't really tell. So the best way to do that would be to cut into your breast and take part of it away and look at it under a microscope. That's called a biopsy to find out whether or not there is something. And in our third week together of this topic, we're going to be looking at what happens when you feel a lump or when somebody says to you, oh, there's a shadow on your mammogram, right? How do we react, right? What happens when the word cancer suddenly comes on our inner screen? And then in our last week together, we will focus on the woman who has been diagnosed with cancer, the woman who's dancing with cancer, and what her choices are, both in terms of integrative medicine, alternative medicine, radiation, chemotherapy, um, surgery. What are the steps of the dance that will bring the greatest health to us? The wise woman tradition works with Seven medicines, serenity medicine, story medicine, mind medicine, lifestyle medicine, alternative medicine, pharmaceutical medicine, and high-tech medicine. All of those medicines are available to us and available to us for our healing. But to get back to the beginning, because this is our, our first show of this series, what most of us really want to do is stay cancer-free. What most women would like is to know, is there any way that I can prevent breast cancer? And the answer is maybe. Let me start out with some fairly general things, which in fact, um, I'm sure 
that we at least mentioned when we were talking about um, keeping the prostate healthy, and that is that we have found that eating four servings of plants in the cabbage family per week will cut our overall cancer risk by 50%. That's a pretty easy place to start right there. For anybody worried about any kind of cancer in their family or not in their family, eat more cabbage plants. Be sure to eat them cooked. Those cabbage family plants like cauliflower and broccoli, like um, bok choy and Brussels sprouts and red cabbage and turnips and radishes and horseradish, big family of delicious plants. We need to cook them. There's compounds in them that are very disturbing to the thyroid if we eat them raw. And then we'll also remember that there is no nutritive value in raw food. So we're going to get the compounds there from eating those plants. There is one exception, and that is that the particular anti-cancer compounds are the highest in broccoli sprouts. And those could be eaten raw, although cooking them will aid in getting that compound into your body. We've also found that soy foods, especially in terms of the breast and probably in terms of the prostate, have a kind of, mm, shall we say, Jekyll and Hyde aspect. Here's what we think right now about soy foods. If a young woman eats soy foods from the time that she's a child and through the time when her breasts develop, her breast cells develop in the presence of a mild carcinogen that's in soy. And so it's like they have built-in protection. It's like if something is constantly wearing at you, you're going to develop a callus there. Uh, However, if we wait until we already have breasts or we wait until menopause or midlife and then suddenly we start eating a lot of soy, it is probably going to promote breast cancer. Does that include fermented soy as well, Susan? No, it doesn't include. Fermented soy is the exception to that. Okay. And that's miso and tamari. Okay. And I do my best to have either miso or tamari or both on a daily basis. Unlike the cabbage family plants, miso and tamari are not dose-dependent. In other words, we said that if you eat four servings of cabbage family plants in a week, you'll cut your cancer risk by 50%. I bet at least some of you out there are going, okay, I'll eat eight servings a week and I'll eliminate my cancer risk. Ah, But it's not additive. Four or more servings a week cuts your risk by 50%. If you can eat 20 servings a week, you're just going to cut your risk by 50%. However, with miso and tamari, the more you eat, the more protection you get. Now, in the studies that have shown the greatest protection, women are actually eating miso soup three times a day. I don't know if I could do it. But then again, I do a lot of other things. And one of the things that I do is I make sure that my breasts and my immune system are supplied with a repair kit. Isn't that what we always want? I mean, we know how life is. It's rough. There's wear and tear. Things break, right? Right. Accidents happen. And just so, when our cells replicate, accidents happen. Life is rough. There's wear and tear. And so sometimes the DNA isn't made perfectly. When we think about the trillions of cells that are made in our bodies minute by minute and think about what kind of quality control would there have to be to prevent any of them from being wrong, well, it's reasonable to think, as most people do, that all bodies contain some cancer cells all the time. And we do know that there are certain, shall we call them predispositions or genetic mistakes. With breast cancer, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And we know that these give rise to early onset breast cancer um, for women in their 20s, in their 30s, and that these women are also very prone to ovarian cancer. And the repair kit that I'm talking about is in lentils, 
which is a food, and red clover, which I use as a nourishing herbal infusion. Now we're going to come back to lentils and red clover because they're very important and I want to talk a little more about them. But I want to also say that another way that will very much, especially in these genetic cases, help to prevent breast cancer and ovarian cancer, as a matter of fact, lower the risk of ovarian cancer by 1,000% and lower the risk of breast cancer by about 500% is to take birth control pills. And most people are absolutely shocked by that. Yeah, I am as well, because uh, I had always heard the opposite of that. Well, <clears throat> I like to talk about a woman who's still alive. She lives in India, and she was married when she was 14. And she had her first child before she ever menstruated. She had her last child when she was in her early 60s. And between the age of 14 and 64, she never menstruated. In fact, she never once menstruated in her entire life. Now, would we say that that's normal or abnormal? It sounds abnormal to me. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it sounds very clogging. Because we're used to what the experts call unchecked ovulation. An unchecked ovulation, of course, gives rise to menstruation month after month after month. And talk about wear and tear, you know what? Our bodies aren't designed for it. What she experienced is the design plan. It's certainly not what I want, and it's not what you want, because, hello, we're Western women. We have been brought up with a different worldview and a different view of ourselves. So we don't want to spend 50 years of our lives being pregnant, lactating, and raising children. We may want children or a child, but we certainly don't want to spend the better part of our lives doing it, most of us. So, nonetheless, that's the default design for our bodies. And when we don't do that, we're the ones who are being abnormal. Unchecked ovulation, repeated menstruations. There is no exit from the ovary. When we ovulate, the egg breaks a hole in the ovary. After we ovulate, if we have not been pregnant, our body doesn't know right away if we're pregnant or not. It's still kind of naive, shall we say. And so it creates a lot of new cells in the breast just in case we're pregnant and they're going to move toward lactation. It creates a lot of cells in the breast. It creates a lot of cells in the uterus, which is the buildup of the endometrium. The egg is just torn a hole in the ovary. Can we see how this is not kind, gentle, or normal for the female body? Yes. So taking birth control pills replicates being pregnant. It stops ovulation. There is an initial increase in breast cells, just as there would be if you were pregnant, but they stay there so long as you take the birth control pills, unlike a woman who is just cycling where the breast cells build up and then they have to be sloughed off and then they build up again, they have to be sloughed off just like the lining of the uterus. And this is very hard in the breast tissues just like it's hard in the endometrium and hard on the ovaries. So by taking birth control pills, we become like that woman in India. We, go, we revert back to the primary plan for the female human body. Yet, you know, on the birth control package, the insert that comes with it, you know, all the risks and complications that are with it, um, you know, you don't hear this side of it. No. But it, to me, it is, you know, quite interesting. Very. Um, and, it, you know, it was startling to me that, that all of these people I was interviewing were saying, I can tell you what causes breast cancer, unchecked ovulation, menstruating month after month. That's what causes breast cancer. Your and I can also was, hear, yeah, I can hear a collective yeah, your body cheer going designed, up. And a woman who has a child before the age of 20 is almost immune to breast cancer. Wow. 
You know, because most women, it seems to me, especially in the, the Western world, are doing everything they can to not have a menstruation every month. You know, they're trying to, you know, it doesn't fit in with a social lifestyle or, you know, they don't want the aggravation of it. And uh, interestingly enough, that's more normal than not. Mm. You know, uh, yes, they would at previous times have been pregnant. But they would not have had a monthly menses for years and years at a time. Very interesting. Yeah. So there certainly are environmental problems that can throw their weight around in our breasts. I wouldn't want us to think, oh, this is just totally, you know, totally my fault if I had breast cancer. I actually met a woman in her 20s who had breast cancer who grew up on an organic farm. So what can we say? When I was teaching up in Alaska, there was a crew of scientists there from UCLA they wanted to measure pollutants in the air, earth, water, um, in the L.A. basin, and they thought, well, let's go to Alaska and measure the pollutants up there so we can get a baseline. And what they found was that there were far more pollutants in Alaska than in L.A. That's surprising. <laughs> so it's, there's nowhere to run and hide at this point. So let's um, introduce a few terms, and I think that this will help give us some understanding. There are basically three types or groups of estrogens. Estrogens we make in our own bodies. Those are intrinsic ex estrogens. Estrogens that are these environmental pollutants we're talking about, those are xeno, X-E-N-O, xenoestrogens. And then estrogens that we find in plants, and those are phyto estrogens. Now, within those three groups, each one of those groups can also be subdivided into what science calls short path estrogens and long path estrogens. And long path estrogens are the kinds of estrogens that cancer eats. They promote cancer. They don't cause cancer, but they feed it. I say that these long path estrogens are to breast cancer as kerosene is to fire. So kerosene doesn't cause fire, right? Right. It, yeah. But it promotes it, huh? Yes, it exacerbates it, yes. Exactly. So the long path estrogens can promote and feed cancer, and the short path ones can't. Now, because there are literally hundreds of kinds of estrogens, estrogen receptor sites on the cell are not fussy. There are certain receptor sites, you know, that are just, huh, 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 I will only accept, you know, but it's exactly like me, but estrogen receptor sites are real sluts. Anything that looks remotely like estrogen is going to get the go-ahead, come on, baby. So the receptor site is not specific for a short path estrogen or a long path estrogen or an intrinsic estrogen or a xenoestrogen or a phytoestrogen to the body. They're all pretty much one thing. The short path estrogens, however, if they get to the receptor site first, and they do take the short path, will block up or hold up the receptor site so the long path estrogens can't get in. So one of our goals is to be consuming short path estrogens to add to the short path estrogens that are made to our body to counter the long one long path estrogen our body makes, the couple of long path estrogens found in plants, and the xenoestrogens, almost all of which are long path estrogens. Have you heard of the drug tamoxifen? Yes. So what class of compound is it? Is it a protein, a vitamin, a hormone? You know, I don't know that. Um, I, I'm not sure. I've only heard of it, but I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. It's, it's a 
a drug given at this point to almost every woman who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And it is to prevent recurrence of breast cancer, and it is estrogen. It's a short path estrogen. So science is very well aware of what I'm talking about and uses that to their advantage, and we can too, because red clover is loaded with short path estrogens. And lentils also have lots of short path estrogens. Plus, remember, they contain the repair kit that can be used by the immune system to repair damaged DNA, even if it's genetic damage. Now, when I was teaching, I t- taught a week-long workshop about breast health at a wonderful place in Germany called Weg der Mitte, and uh, really got on very well with the, the lovely young man who was cooking for us there. And he would come, and he would kind of open the door to the classroom a crack, and he would kind of listen in to what I was saying. And one of the very first days, he heard me talking about lentils and their tremendous uh, ability uh, in terms of protecting the breast against cancer. And kind of as a, a, a tour de force, he proceeded to serve us lentils at every meal for the next week. And nobody the entire time said, oh, lentils again, or, oh, God, I can't eat lentils. We all went. Oh, my gosh, you can do this with lentils? <laughs> I'm certainly not suggesting that you need to eat lentils three times a day. You don't. But how often do you eat lentils? Could you eat them once a week? Oh, you know, I love lentils. I could eat them probably every day. Yeah, there's lots of different kinds of lentils. Most people um, just think of like the big brown lentils that take a really long time to cook. But we actually use a lot more of the little bitty orange ones. Yeah, I have those too. And the black ones, the French lentils. Mm-hmm. Those are really good as well. So I haven't, I haven't met one I don't like yet. So there you go, <laughs> yay <laughs> lentils, and both the black ones and the orange ones are real quick cookers. The orange ones will cook up in twenty minutes. So uh, before you can say dinner, lentils are ready to eat. We think of them as fast food, and they're really great with yogurt. And of course, that's a wonderful thing too. Uh, wonderful anti-cancer food as well. Now, I add turmeric to mine. Um, I've always read that that's an anti-cancer spice. It sure is. That's a great addition. And um, it tastes good in the lentils, and it's a great place to put it because our minds are already thinking turmeric-flavored when we're looking at the lentils. I wanted to eat more turmeric, but I have had a very difficult time getting it into the rest of my food. Okay. Because it does have a fairly strong taste, you know, and my mind is just not used to it. I, you know, yes. I will persist, but yes. uh, the lentils are definitely a, a place where it really goes wonderfully well. And I agree with you. It's a fabulous antioxidant plant. So I make a red clover infusion. And just to go over that, we take one ounce of dried red clover blossom. And I do prefer to blo- buy the red clover dried rather than to use it fresh and to buy red clover blossoms rather than the leaves and blossoms. And interestingly enough, it's because the leaves have a lot more phytoestrogens in them. And I'm just not sure um, if that's okay. I know that all of the people before me who used red clover and who were very much in touch with the plants use the blossoms. And so I'm going to stick with that at this point. It, it, my gut sense is that the blossoms is what we want to use and the, the leaves that, that are with them. But to actually harvest red clover blossoms, I'd have to go way down on the plant. And it wouldn't be easy or convenient the way picking just the blossoms is. So that's, people have been asking a lot about that. And um, I do definitely pick my own and dry it for use in making red clover infusion. And I weigh out one ounce of the red clover blossoms. It's really important to weigh the herb because herbs are different density. The volume of red clover, well, of course, will be far, far more for one ounce than, say, the volume of oat straw would be for one ounce. So this is why I encourage everyone to buy a scale and to weigh out your herb for your infusion. I've been making infusions nightly for over a quarter of a century, and I weigh out the herb every single night. And, of course, from batch to batch, it also the volume is a little different, but the weight always stays the same. 
Uh-huh. One ounce of uh, red clover blossom, put it in a quart jar, fill that jar right up to the top of the boiling water, take a wooden spoon, stir it. The herb will absorb some water. Put some more water in until it's filled at the top. Put a tight lid on it and let it steep for four hours or overnight. So it's four to ten hours. And then we're going to take the lid off and strain the herb and squeeze that herb really good, especially with red clover because it's kind of spongy, so really like use both hands. When I do that, I go, ha, ah, I'll never have arthritis. Ha, ha, look at all this great compressing that my, my hands are getting. Yes, what a good exercise. Ha, ah, yeah. And uh, just an aside here, you know, my uh, uh, in New Zealand, my uh, Maori uh, elders uh, said, don't expect any herb to work for you if you throw it in the trash. So wherever I am, I don't throw my spent infusion herb in the trash. If I can put it in the compost pile, I do. And if not, I put it in a baggie. And then I empty that baggie with the herb onto the earth as soon as I find a place to do that. Because um, we want to keep that cycle of respect going. We want to keep that cycle of taking care of each other and being part of this whole dance of life here on the planet together. Yeah, so I then I refrigerate the red clover infusion, and I drink it up. I, my goal is to drink a quart of infusion a day, and that's what I ask my apprentices to do as well, is to not drink water or anything else, but to drink a quart of infusion a day. And then after that, after a really hot day, and they want some water, that's certainly fine. But, you know, once you get into drinking infusion, it just seems like a waste to drink water. It's like, why drink water when you can drink infusion? It's loaded with vitamins and minerals. You know, it's more nourishing than any vitamin water that you could buy. There's more electrolytes than any Gatorade that you can get. And uh, so there it is here. Nourishing herbal infusion and red clover is the world's leading anti-cancer herb. And there's been more authenticated reports of people with cancer diagnosed by biopsy curing themselves of cancer using red clover than from just about any other herb. That is safe and easy to use at home. There's some big time herbs that you have to inject. Um, but um, to me, that's a little bit out of my range of what I want to do, whereas red clover, I can use red clover on a regular basis to protect my breasts and to know that I'm loading it with short path estrogens. You know, the short path estrogens that we find in plants are not really in a form that we can use yet. When we consume them, we have to ferment them. And that's a fermentation that has to go on inside our gut. We have to have gut flora that works on these phytosterols, which are very large molecules, and actually changes their structure so that they become you know, more human-like, more bioidentical, shall we say. And because this is a fermentation and conversion process, of course, there are metabolites created. So they're metabolic byproducts. And those metabolic byproducts are thrown off into the blood and then go to the kidneys and then are excreted in our urine. So if we feed a group of 100 women lentils and then we measure the amount of metabolites in their urine from this process, the 25 who are excreting the most are 400% less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer in the next 10 years than the 25 who excrete the least. So we have some really strong scientific evidence that loading with phytoestrogens confers a very strong protective effect against breast cancer. As my mentor, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, always reminded us, life is chaos. You cannot bargain with life. You do your best. That doesn't mean you won't step through the hole. There are no guarantees. But we can still do our best. And drinking red flavor infusion, well, you know what? It's really pleasant. Okay. I don't find it personally totally pleasant because red flavor infusion tastes like black tea. And I never really developed a taste for black tea. It's kind of bitter to me. So what I do is I fool my nose by putting a pinch, and I mean literally a pinch, just the amount I can pinch between my thumb and my finger, a pinch of mint in with my ounce of red clover. And then when I drink the, the red clover, I smell mint and I taste mint and I Fool myself into thinking that it's mint. 
And it works so nicely that I'm able to, well, actually, I'm drinking red clover infusion right as we talk. I poured my red clover infusion over ice because it's hot today, and I like my infusion ice. But, you know, red clover infusion is really good to heat it up with honey in it, too. And, yeah, you could heat it up a little bit, stir that honey in it, and then chill it and have it iced with a little honey in it, you know. There isn't, like, a whole set of strict rules about how you drink these infusions. You can add whatever you need or want to add to them. You want some sweetener? Sure. You want to put some milk in it? Sure. You want some whiskey in it? Go right ahead. You want some fruit juice? Well, I might question your wisdom in doing that. But uh, what's important is drinking the infusion. One of my apprentices really wanted her mom to drink some nourishing herbal infusion. She just knew that it would help her. And uh, her mom wasn't having any of it. And I said, what does your mom like to drink? We could, you know, like get her to mix it. And she says, well, she drinks all kinds of different things. And then she looked at me and she said, but whatever she drinks, she puts ice in. I said, okay. So she's going to take the infusion after she strains it. She's going to put it in an ice cube tray and freeze it up as ice cubes. And that's the ice she's going to use. And it worked great. She was able to consume a quart of infusion every day using it as ice cubes in whatever else she drank. That's a clever idea. (laughs) Yeah. Make it easy. Make it fun. A red clover is a wonderful nourishing herbal infusion. And, of course, the beans are also, uh, all of the beans, not just the lentils, are wonderful sources of phytoestrogens, the short estrogens that can help to block off cancer as well. So certainly, you know, we, what we were talking about with the soybeans, it's really important to remember that um, this is because soy just contains one of the four groups of phytoestrogens, whereas the red clover contains all four groups. There's lots more information about anti-cancer foods and about keeping your immune system healthy in breast cancer question mark, breast health, exclamation point. Although, let me tell you, and it's kind of scary, Cancer cells can disguise themselves so your immune system can't recognize them. Let's come back in a week and talk about mammograms, whether or not we really need them, okay? That sounds great, Susan. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Green blessings. Thank you for joining us this evening, Susan. Join us next week to continue our discussion of breast care, including mammography, thermography, and self-examinations. On behalf of Time Monk Radio, be well.